in case you need any other help. Thank you. I think we're live. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started in one minute. Good afternoon. Before we start the meeting, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, if you would like to view the captions or subtitles for today's webinar, please select closed captions in your Zoom menu bar. Second, to minimize, to maximize the amount of information we can share today, we will not be fielding questions. Presenters have provided their contact information and we encourage you to follow up with them directly after the webinar. Welcome and I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Hayfield. Good afternoon. And we'll welcome to today's webinar where together we'll celebrate the 2020 Best Practices Awards. Brave New World, this is a webinar, and we're so glad you could join us today as we acknowledge this year's wonderful winners. I am delighted to have the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services link arms with the Commonwealth Council on Aging and Dominion Energy to present this webinar. What a great partnership. Within DARS, I would especially like to thank the DARS communications team and our video teleconferencing staff for helping make this webinar possible. As we all say, it takes a village and during this pandemic, we're all learning how to work together. So many of you have participated in the annual Best Practices Award ceremonies. This year, it's a bit different. In years past, the Council on Aging's annual Best Practices Award ceremonies were held all across the Commonwealth. They were actually on site of each of the winners. The in-person ceremonies gave programs and organizations an opportunity to host staff, volunteers, clients, elected officials, and others, along with representatives of the Commonwealth Council who traveled around the state to present the awards and highlight these exemplary programs. Well, as you know, in-person ceremonies are just not viable this year. The department, the Council on Aging, and Dominion Energy are here today to assure that we shine a light on the winners and share each of their wonderful stories. While we miss gathering together, we are together virtually, and there are some advantages to the webinar format. Not only can more folks attend the virtual event, and I know we had over 60 people registered for today, the webinar will also stay on the DARS YouTube page and be linked on the DARS Aging Boards and Councils page. This will allow those who could not be here with us today for the live event to access at a later date and at their leisure to celebrate the good work that we're going to highlight today. Before I hand it over to my colleagues, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge some of our esteemed presenters. Those joining us today are Bill Murray. Bill is Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Communications with Dominion Energy. He has been a longtime champion of these awards and we are grateful for his support and his advocacy so that Dominion Energy provides monetary awards for the winners. Also with us today is Diana Pagawa, member of the Commonwealth Council on Aging and our committee chair, Best Practices Awards Committee. She's a member. Diana will offer our closing remarks today. 
And last but certainly not least, the well-known and respected Dr. Richard Lindsay, former Commonwealth Council on Aging member and a chair of the 2020 Best Practices Awards Committee. Dr. Lindsay has guided this ship for many years and we've been so very lucky to have him at the helm. Now, on with the show. I'm pleased to turn the webinar over to Dr. Lindsay. Take it away. Thank you, Commissioner Hayfield. And uh, welcome to the 2020 Best Practice Award. Uh, this is an award, uh, as she's already indicated, that's changed. This is the first year we've had a webinar and uh, it's an experience for all of us. At the same time, I think we're all excited about the possibility in the future we'll go back to where we were. I think I wanted to mention that uh, this whole thing was made possible because of Charlotte's uh, Harbor Gas good work in terms of getting us all linked together technologically along with Dave McKenzie, so I appreciate that. Let's go on to the next slide, uh, Charlotte. I've been privileged to serve under nine uh, governors of the Commonwealth of Virginia either on the Governor's Advisory Board or the Commonwealth Council on Aging. And these are the gentlemen I had the privilege to work with. Virginia's been honored, I think, to have such a tremendous leadership over this long period of time. The next slide. One of the things we look at uh, as members of the Commonwealth Council Best Practice Committee is we have to have really strict criteria because the number of applications uh, that come in each year has been increasing and they're outstanding. So it's difficult to decide who is gonna be a winner. What do we look for? Well, we look for a couple of things. One thing, we look for sustainability. We want programs that can go on. Two, we're looking for a program that other communities can replicate, depending upon uh, the, the substance of the, of the application. And above all, we emphasize what the, what the response of this application was to community need, and also something that's gonna promote aging in the community. And we look for inclusiveness. We want to make sure it's sustainable financially. So it's a tough job and the committee has been very, very able. I've been very fortunate to have a good committee all these years. I've been on the committee, I guess, uh, 14 years. Next slide. Next slide is a trailer. Every good movie has a trailer. You're gonna hear from each of the award winners this afternoon, but I thought I'd just whet your appetite. On the left, you can see the new River Valley Agency, agency program called Staples for Seniors and Fido's Pantry. And of course, uh, there's Fido. In the middle, you see a uh, Santerra Martha Jefferson Hospital from Charlottesville program called Jimmy's Pet Pals. And on the right, you see uh, a tie. There were two programs that we felt uh, worthy of our uh, consideration this year. One is the Arlington Area Agent Age program called Medication Safety for Older Arlingtonians. And that's coupled with the Fairfax AAA uh, program called uh, Volunteer Solutions and Helping Hands program. And you see on the right-hand side, the picture of that room that's all cluttered. I want to get these people to come to my house before I'm all through. So we'll work on that before the program's over. Next slide. The next slide is a, is a shot slide which shows the, my travels in the 14 years we've had the program. In the center, you see the awards themselves lines up on the table. They don't, don't look very big, but they really make a huge impact in the communities where they are placed. And I think it's just an amazing uh, job on the part of these various organizations that they do come up with these innovative ideas. You'll see some of your friends in the pictures and certainly I've been everywhere from boards of uh, council boards to other boards to present these awards, but I miss the, the local flavor. Next slide. And I think I will close by saying we're here today to honor the 2020 Best Practice Award winners. But before I leave, I want again to reiterate the fact that I've had the privilege of serving with some outstanding Virginians on the Best Practice Committee over the years we've had this 14 years of uh, service. Especially want to thank Amy Marchine and, and uh, her now uh, current occupant, Charlotte Arbogast. Without these people to keep us organized and keep us on track, I think the committee would have stumbled a number of times. And I particularly want to thank Charlotte's work to get this webinar off the ground because it's a, it's a very difficult task. I think that the Best Practice Awards won the Commonwealth Council's great legacy for the Commonwealth. And I wish in the future that the Best Practice Committee has uh, all the good luck and good members we've had in the past. I, I'll miss the excitement of our annual awards trip greatly. I hope that in the future, before too long, we'll be able to visit you back on your home turf and make the local citizenry much more aware of the tremendous job that all of your organizations are doing. So thank you all for attending today's webinar. Until our paths cross again, stay healthy. Thank you. I'll pass that over to the next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Tina King. I'm the Executive Director with New River Valley Agency on Aging and Senior Services. And I have with me today, Shannon Hammond, who's really the brainchild of our award-winning program, Staples for Seniors 
and Fido's Pantry. Um, Shannon is our Marketing Director and Development Director. We are so honored and excited to have our program selected by the Commonwealth Council on Aging for Best Practices Award, and we're very happy to share with you this afternoon our experiences in developing and sustaining our programs. Both programs were established after we were um, able to get some feedback through some extensive surveys that we did with our nutrition services clients, and we were able to determine that a large number had significant levels of food security issues, and many of them didn't have the funds to buy pet food for their very valued pets. So I'm going to turn this over to Shannon. I'm going to let him tell us more, tell you all more about how we develop the program and how we're sustaining it. Thank you, Tina. And before I start out, I just want to say congratulations to everyone best practice and for the second and third place winners, because I personally feel we are all recipients of best practices. We work in the senior industry in AAAs and that is so meaningful day in and day out, all that we do. But as Tina mentioned, um, the, the program itself started out um, in looking at a survey Tina. for the, um, for the um, home delivered meals clients. Uh, we basically set out to ask a very open-ended question, what else is on your mind? And we learned from that very quickly that seniors were struggling with food insecurity in their homes and they mentioned the weekend. So from that point, we basically looked at, you have a couple hundred households across the New River Valley, hundreds of priority needs. Uh, how will we begin to address this? Um, so what we basically looked at doing uh, is looking at a model program that we know has been replicated time and again in the, the nation, and that is Micah's Backpack. Uh, you all are familiar with that program that helps children have food at home after school. So we didn't want to redo and re-engineer the process, but we also wanted to basically engineer it for the older adult. Um, and it was only upon learning of the needs in the household that we discovered what was happening with the kids. And as Tina mentioned, you know, when seniors were struggling to feed themselves, you can only imagine with a cat or a dog equally struggling. And seniors told us time and again, they were giving away what food they had in their home to keep their cat or dog alive, even taking home delivered meals and feeding them to their pets so that they would stay alive. If we can move to the next slide, I'm having a little bit of trouble. I don't think it's advancing. Here we go. So I, we produced a handbook for you that really are lessons what we've learned along the way. We pioneered it, but I will tell you we haven't perfected it. And it will take us all moving along, those that want to replicate this program, we'll all learn together. Uh, but something I wanted to mention is when we started this program, you can imagine you're dealing with an issue like hunger. How do you get the word out? How do you spread it quickly? How do you get the food donations in where we can start stocking the cupboards? Here comes social media. Facebook was the formula that found their donors and that found, um, you know, it found their donors, but it also found the, uh, the means that we could share our message quickly. Um, and it worked phenomenally well. We had no idea when we first started what would actually be taking place. We quickly learned in a matter of weeks that offices became filled, the conference rooms were filled. We didn't have space to store all of the goods. That is the power of social media right there. So we're very appreciative sending out one message spread. And if we can move on to the next slide, it brought in a tremendous number of donors. Um, I just give you a sampling here. It's a pretty diverse mix. Churches were the first ones that started out. I mean, they know Micah's backpack. They were familiar with it. They knew kind of what to do. They knew the motions to move to get these hunger relief programs started. 
but we also got children for the first time in the agency's history that we got Cub Scouts, we got teenagers in high school working with us. Uh, the shot that you see is a beta club at a high school here in the New River Valley that is continuing to work with us. We've had businesses through the Chamber of Commerce, realtors, we've had long-term care industries really come forth to do this. They understand hunger. It's a very basic need. Um, on to the next slide. And as you can imagine, with a program like this, one thing that we didn't think about were volunteers. We tried to reach the means to the end to get food in the households, but it quickly became a full-time job for several of us as staff here at the agency. And, you know, we realize we need volunteers to kind of help steer the train as we're moving it to help the New River Valley seniors. So we presently have 26 program volunteers. We've added two that specifically want to dedicate their time to vital to um, But, you know, the average time commitment's only about three to four hours per month. It's not a lot that we ask. What we have found is these volunteers are in the workforce. So they're actually doing their volunteer time on the weekend. And I'll talk a little bit in a moment how that kind of changed some dynamics for us. But one thing that is really important is with, we found with volunteers, never assume they know your program. Uh, what we have found, and it, it's nothing uh, on part of any volunteer, but when they work a specific area, that's what they know. And they may at times not see the bigger picture, but it's a New River Valley program. It's four counties in an independent city. So that's something that we really had to learn as we went through continual training that we worked with those volunteers to, to help them better understand the program. And then if you will, troubleshoot things. Um, On to the next slide. Budget, as you can see, it takes a diverse mix, like it does volunteers. We have product donations, cash, grants, and donor designated funds. And I will say you need that mix to keep your program going. We're really pleased that we actually have all the proceeds coming in. It's 100% volunteer then. Okay, and on to our last slide. Lessons learned. I think one thing to look at is a calendar. Know where your gaps are. From your holidays, you're going to run into some lean months in the beginning of the year. Also kind of look at that calendar of where money's going to come from. When are grants up for grabs? When do you need to be looking at your donor uh, engagements to raise more money for your program? Continue with social media. It is the best free tool that you will ever put your hands on. And we have fun with the program. You should look at our Facebook page and see the kind of posts that we put up. And then lastly, on to our last slide. And then I'm going to turn this back to Tina. Thank you, Shannon. That was a quick overview, as you know, but we would really encourage anyone who would like to know more about developing a similar program to uh, contact us because we have, thanks to Shannon, a very detailed how-to manual to get started and how to sustain things and to make it more successful. Um, we so appreciate, as I said before, this opportunity. We appreciate those who sponsor the award and, and those, uh, the Commonwealth Council on Aging, who sponsors uh, the Best Practices Award each year and are very excited with anyone who would like to learn more to just work with you, how do you visit in the future, if that's a possibility, or whatever works best um, to develop the program. Thank you. Okay, so um, hello and thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Abby Denby. I'm a director of patient care services at Sintera Martha Jefferson Hospital. Um, and I'll just start with letting you know how this program became to be. Um, so my father, Jimmy, was an avid dog lover. Um, he was hospitalized for a hip fracture and he had pretty severe dementia. 
and with his dementia came lots of agitation, combativeness, it was very challenging to care for him. Um, during one of his combative episodes, I um, called my mom, who lived right down the street, and I just said, you know, hey, mom, can you please bring your dog up to see dad, to see if that would help distract him. And uh, a little bit later, I, I came in, and the nurse was going to go get some Haldol from the um, physician, which is an antipsychotic medication to calm patients down. And um, so I walked in the room when my mom was there, and my dad, that's a picture of him there with her dog, was just happy and relaxed. And I first thought, like, wow, that how doll worked, and it worked quickly. In came the nurse with the how doll. So at this point, he hadn't even gotten the how doll, and it was all about this dog. Uh, so it really made a big difference to my dad. So... Abby, do you want me to advance it? So um, a friend of ours saw these um, Joy for All companion pets by Hasbro in the New York Times. And when I was telling her how the dog affected dad, she said, have you seen this article? So I quickly got on Amazon, ordered dad a dog right away. Um, and once we gave the dog to my dad, he was not in restraints again. He didn't need any more handle. He was extremely manageable. You know, there were certainly times where he was challenging, but the majority of the time it made such a significant difference, not only for my father, but for all the caregivers who provided care for him because it was really distressing to them to not be able to provide the care that they wanted to give. So next slide. So here came about Jimmy's pet pal. That's my dad with his uh, little pet pal that he had. Um, and what these are, are they are lifelike robotic animals. They have a cat and a dog. The cat uh, comes with a brush and you can brush the cat and it purrs and it meows. Um, it will actually roll over and um, so you can brush its stomach. And then the dog uh, wags its tail, it barks and it pans. And it actually will turn its head to where it hears noise. So it's very responsive to the individual who's holding the dog at that time. Um, so um, here we are with this program here. Next slide. So just about our facility, Sintera is a um, healthcare is a 12 hospital system. It's a not-for-profit um, organization. And I am at Sentara Martha Jefferson Hospital, which is a 176-bed not-for-profit community hospital in Central Virginia. Um, and I've been with the organization for 19 years. And my, my father was a patient here at this hospital when this all presented itself. Next slide. So this program began, um, my father passed away in September of 2017 from that hospitalization. Um, and uh, the program kicked off in early 2018. And um, I brought a presentation, including a video of my dad with his pet pal, um, to our Patient and Family Advisory Council, which has community members um, and also people who are part of our um, foundation. And when I presented this, Susie Morris, um, who is a community member, loved the idea and she graciously funded the beginning of the entire program. Um, so definitely a special thanks to Susie Morris. Um, so other donations were then made, um, certainly in lieu of flowers when my dad passed and then it's opened up to the community. So if anybody wants to donate to the foundation, they can specify that it goes to Jimmy's Pet Pal. Um, so we've had some great uh, support. The staff can give out a cat or dog to any patient who has Alzheimer's or dementia who is agitated, combative, or depressed. Um, 
and they just give it to the patient in order to improve the patient experience uh, and then the caregiver's experience as well. And um, they don't need a physician order. They don't really need anything other than the care to and to think about to give to these patients. We've provided about 50 animals um, thus far. So uh, the only thing that is extremely important for everybody to remember is when you're giving out these animals, you want to make sure if the patient, one is an animal lover, and if they like cats or dogs, I always joke and say that if my husband was given a cat, he would think he died and didn't go to heaven. Um, but if he got a dog, he would certainly feel like he was in heaven. So it, it is important to get to know your patient before you provide these animals. So the next slide. So the program of um, impact it's had. So I've had so many family members, caregivers, and staff just talk about the program. Um, I had, I was at the nursing station of one of the units and somebody said, oh, this is the person who started Jimmy's Pet Pals. And her mother had gotten a cat and she ran up to me and gave me a big hug and she just started crying. And she said, you know, it's the first time she has eaten in weeks. She is just so happy. Um, you know, people have said the dog settled them down, they're peaceful and relaxed, or, you know, I've been able to provide care much easier for my patients now that they have that pet pal. So we've gotten a lot of just anecdotal feedback. Um, and then the patients can also take these animals with them. You know, we they're theirs to keep because we can't clean them. Um, so I hope certainly that the impact goes well beyond the acute care setting. Next slide. Um, so for a future of the program, because a lot of the, all of the data that I have now is just anecdotal and, um, you know, word of mouth. So I am doing a pilot study to measure agitation level through a Pittsburgh agitation scale um, before the patient gets the pet pal and after um, every four hours for about 24 hours. And then we're looking at antipsychotic medication use and restraint use before and after a patient receives the pet pal. Um, I am in my doctoral program at James Madison, and this is actually the, pro the um, pilot study is what I'm doing for my doctoral program. Um, part of that is also that we're sending out a survey to all the nurses and nursing assistants who have ever cared for a patient with a pet pal to answer questions about what it was like to provide care before and after. So it includes medication administration, activities of daily living, and then the, the hopefulness or the, you know, hopefully they'll become less helpless feeling with the utilization of these pet pals. So the pilot study is underway, and so the results are pending. Um, but I've also gotten accepted to a national conference to um, submit the findings, which is exciting because I think just the more places that can be presented, hopefully people will replicate the program. Um, the pets are $100 each. So at this point, the foundation will continue to cover that here at the Tara Martha Jefferson. Um, and certainly the generous award from this program um, will fund, you know, at least 30 more of them. So thank you so much. Um, and we will just continue to come to provide the service and, and um, hopefully just get the word out so more and more people can start this. You know, you see it a lot in long-term care facilities, but if you review the literature, there's, I, I wasn't able to find, I think I found one hospital that was using them in the ICU, but that's about all the literature is about using them in the acute care setting. And, you know, it's just made a significant difference here and, um, you know, I think just in memory of my father, it, it, you know, certainly brings me great joy to see this program continue. Next slide. So here is certainly my contact information and again, special thanks, like I said, to the Commonwealth Council on Aging and Dominion and the committee, you know, for uh, allowing the staff at Martha Jefferson to continue to bring joy to all. Um, and there's my contact information. Um, there's also a link there uh, that if anybody clicks on it, you can see my father with his pet pal um, and his interactions with it. So 
um, thank you so much and I'm really happy to have had this opportunity. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Coates and I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Arlington County Area Agency on Aging. Um, and I want to extend my congratulations to my fellow awardees um, and just thank you for your work. And, and Abby, I definitely will be in, in touch. I think there's um, really great ideas that we're hearing and, and that's another one of the many benefits of events like this. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'm here just to talk a little bit about the medication safety program for older Arlingtonians. Um, Arlington County, like, like many other communities throughout the Commonwealth, uh, we're seeing a growth in our population of older adults. And we know that research indicates that older adults um, tend to have more, take more medications than other, um, other age cohorts. Uh, the other trend that we're, we're seeing is the increase in the use um, and, and misuse of opioids. Um, the Arlington Agency on Aging really sought, saw this as an opportunity to raise community awareness and provi provide resources to safely discard medications. Um, we looked at uh, what are some of the natural points um, and potential sort of touchstones where older adults may be um, limited in safely discarding their medications um, or where we're already collecting some of this information where because of an assessment or eligibility, we may be asking um, for a list of, of medications. We looked at community partners and we're thrilled to partner with Arlington's Addiction and Recovery Initiative or um, ARI as one of our, our many acronyms that, that we use in our work, as well as the Arlington VICAP program our Medicare counseling program and our close partners with our Home Delivered Meals on Wheels programs. We also looked at some of the partnerships with our first responders um, and, and opportunities to partner in terms of prevention, outreach, training and education around the safe disposal of medications. Um, I, I don't know if there, there should be some pictures here as well. Oh, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so the Arlington um, Addiction and Recovery Initiative or ARI is a community wide stakeholders group that really strives to com combat the opioid epidemic. Um, and we reached out, the AAA reached out to ARI um, to look at delivering drug deactivation kits um, as part of our meal delivery through our meals on wheels program and the photo on the left hand side we, we've we tend to pick the coldest days in February um, and we deliver these deactivation kits as well as some information about how to safely discard medications, reviewing a list of medications that have expired that are unused um, and providing this information with the meal delivery. We also, uh, following a wonderful presentation last year at our, our at before a around safe medication disposal, we also started to look at what are some of the other other um, sort of touch points and through under the, the leadership of Michelle Thomas our Arlington County's VICAP coordinator. We thought a great opportunity would be our Medicare open enrollment um, and I'm, I'm sure you're all preparing for the upcoming 2020 season, which is just on the horizon. But this was a great opportunity where individuals are sharing a list of medications with us as part of um, the open enrollment season. So what better time than encouraging people to think about what, what medications are you no longer taking? What are the ones that are um, in, in your cabinet that you, you need to safely um, dispose of? And so while um, during the open enrollment session, our VICAP team was providing these drug deactivation kits um, as part of the Medicare counseling session. We also incorporated um, distribution of our drug deactivation kits in our annual emergency preparedness events. Um, the photo on the right hand side there is from an event that we did in September of 2019 
with our local chapter of the Red Cross. Um, each, each September, um, we would work with our independent living residences for, for older adults um, to host a, an emergency preparedness event. And this year, um, we, or in 2019, we included providing the drug deactivation kits, which was very helpful um, because we invite our first responders, our law enforcement, um, and one of the uh, one of the first responders said, "Ask the audience, how do you discard of your medications?" And a woman shared, "Well, well, I flush them." And so he had the opportunity to provide why we should not flush our medications, why we shouldn't throw them in the trash, um, the risk that that causes, not just sort of to the environment, but the exposure of um, others potentially accessing medications, which may include op opioids. Um, so we were able to provide these drug deactivation kits. As you can see from the pictures, um, they're pretty small, they're pretty contained, but it is a safe way for individuals who may have some challenges getting to one of our um, one of our physical locations to discard their medications. It's providing them with those opportunities. Because of this partnership, our, our Meals on Wheels programs, as well as our VICAP programs, have really benefited from this partnership with ARI. Um, we've been able to elevate some of the needs of our older adults. We've also been able to address um, those who may be at higher risk of having unused um, medications. And this is something that we plan to continue. Uh, this is a, a great program and um, I encourage anyone who is not connected with their, their local community services board um, or, or mental health, behavioral health program to reach out, make a connection, even if it, it, it may be your, your local law enforcement. Um, but many of the community services boards have drug deactivation kits that they are willing and, and able to provide um, through our partnership with, with ARI. There was no cost. Um, it was just um, retrieving the drug deactivation kits and, and finding finding the ways that we can distribute them into the community um, so that our, our older adults have a way to safely discard their medications. Um, but like all of our programs, we know that um, AAAs, we, we don't operate in, in silos. And so I just want to take a moment to thank our, our many partners um, within the AAA, Helen King and Galar Basiri, within VICAP, Michelle Thomas, our, our VICAP coordinator, and then our partners at Ari, um, Emily Sfinkland, Suzanne Somerville, Lin Ling, and of course our, our Meals on Wheels Arlington partners. If anyone does have any questions, you are welcome to connect with me, um, but this is a, um, a, a simple program that I think has a potential um, to really have a, a, a significant impact. Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa Brown. I'm the director of Volunteer Solutions, which is a program housed under the Area Agency on Aging with Fairfax County Government. And first I wanna say thank you to everyone who is involved in choosing the Helping Hands program um, to receive this award. We are very grateful and honored that we were chosen. Um, I will first start, I think I can change my own slides. Maybe not, I think so. Um, so the mission of the Department of Family Services for Fairfax County is to promote the well-being of the county's diverse community by protecting and improving the lives of children, adults, and families with su supportive services, education, and advocacy, and more specifically, Volunteer Solutions, our program is, um, our mission is to mobilize and connect volunteers with meaningful opportunities to improve the lives of older adults, adults with disabilities, and family caregivers. So directly in line with those missions came the Helping Hands program. And uh, Charlotte, I don't know that it's letting me advance my slide or it's just delayed maybe. Okay, I can do it. Okay. Where do you want this one? Um, yeah, right there, thank you. Okay. Just say next slide and I'll do it for you. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So Helping Hands um, was created in 2013 and it was created in honor of Older Americans Month but really we saw a need that, you know, we wanted to help older adults and adults with disabilities to be able to age in place safely and with dignity for as long as they choose to stay in their home. And we realized that there was, um, 
a rise in evictions due to clients or people in the community, older adults having homes that they had a lot of things in that either they weren't physically able to discard or maybe it was because you know they um, were hoarding things or they couldn't pay somebody to discard those things. And also sometimes if they were in a single family home, their yard perhaps, they couldn't get out and do the yard work and they didn't have the funds to clean that up. So the HOA would cite them. So there was a lot, of, we were seeing a lot of that. So the Helping Hands program was created. And what that is, is that we have volunteers, individuals and groups that perform these services, decluttering, um, doing intensive yard work, sometimes repairs, depending on the group that's involved, and really just trying to organize and help that population stay in their home safely and with dignity. The next slide, Charlotte. So since 2013, there's been 37 partnerships created just solely related to Helping Hands. And I chose this picture because this is an, a good example of two of our partnerships, one internal and one external partnership. So the internal partnership, that roll off dumpster, a lot of the times the homes that we're going in, when I say we, it's the 10 volunteer solutions staff in addition to the volunteers, because um, uh, our staff are on site. The homes that we go in, there's a lot of belongings and items that need to be discarded. And usually just the couple of trash cans that they have aren't sufficient enough. So we partnered with our solid waste division and they provide us with the roll offs, the, free of charge to be able to get those items out of the house, to discard them. And that's been a partnership for quite a few years now. And then the volunteer group here, it's Young Men's Service League of Vienna, Oakton, and it's moms and sons. And they've done a couple projects for us that they come together as a group. They do community service um, throughout the Fairfax area, but they come together to do inside or outside projects. And they just do a fantastic job at, in helping the clients to be able to do that yard work or inside the house either way. Um, so I liked that picture of the partnership because it was a good example of external and internal partnerships. And truly without the partnerships, we would not be able to sustain the Helping Hands program. I say partnerships and donations. Another example of a partnership that we have is Fannie Mae. Um, they help us out with not only providing volunteers, but they provide supplies to be able to do projects, more intensive projects to help the population that we serve. So really without the, um, without the partnerships, we would not be able to sustain the program because we don't have a budget, which as you all know, without a budget, it's hard to sustain that. So next slide, please, Charlotte. So who we serve are the clients of the Fairfax County Government Adult and Aging Division of the Department of Family Services, uh, clients that are unable to perform these tasks by themselves or unable to pay someone. And as I said earlier, um, maybe some clients are at risk of eviction or they're already in the eviction process. So we try to either slow that down or prevent that by going into with the volunteer groups. Next slide. So we also serve Fairfax City and Falls Church City. So it's not just Fairfax County. And who we've served so far or our stats are, we've had 757 volunteers and 112 clients serve through Helping Hands. And it is only one time a year technically that we provide the service. So that's a pretty big number since it's not really throughout the year. We have prevented 11 evictions, created 37 new partnerships, and there's been a total of over 3,400 volunteer hours valued at over $88,000. So that's pretty impressive for a program that doesn't have a budget and only happens technically once a year. I think so at least. Next slide, please. So really, you know, I can throw stats out all day long and numbers and say how great it is that, you know, we have this many volunteers, but when you actually see the pictures of the, the before and after, I think that makes the most impact. And you can see the picture on the left is before the person's dining living room area, I mean, I'm sorry, dining area that they couldn't, they could not walk through there. They couldn't eat at their table and they definitely couldn't walk through there safely. And many of our clients, as you all know, are at risk of falling. So with that much stuff in one place, it's kind of hard to navigate around that. And really these are one-time projects. So volunteers go in with the volunteer solution staff, usually, you know, like a couple hours in the morning or a couple hours in the afternoon. 
maybe four hours with a group of volunteers and that's what they can accomplish in that little bit of time. So you know, they just, our volunteers continue to amaze us with, you know, how willing they are to get in there and just start working and what they accomplish in that amount of time. Next slide. So this is an example of an outside project. Uh, we had a client who, she still had a single family home. She had trouble getting around, but she really enjoyed being outside and did gardening and just liked, you know, piddling around in the yard, but she just accumulated a lot of stuff over time and she physically couldn't get rid of it. She didn't have anybody in the area to do so. So as you can see, um, one afternoon, we were able to just clean it up so that she could go out and enjoy the outside of her home and just, you know, do what brought her her pleasure. And next slide. So again, if you look at the top left picture, it's not only about preventing evictions, but a lot of times there are code enforcement or code enforcement is already involved or is soon to be involved. And clearly when you have items that are stacked that high, that is a safety hazard for anybody, much less an older adult who might have trouble getting out. There's a fire or something. Um, so on the right of that, you see after how much was removed from that area so that the client could have an open free space free of clutter that code enforcement wasn't going to cite them for same with the bedroom the bedroom obviously not as bad as the other room um, but you know really it takes all 10 of our volunteer solutions staff in addition to their regular jobs to make helping hands happen in addition to those partnerships i was talking about and the the volunteers and we would not be able to do it without that combination of everybody involved. And that is how we sustain the program. Uh, last slide, I think. So if you, you know, have questions or want to learn more about how we got the program up and running or sustain it, I'm happy to talk with you about it further and you have my contact information. And again, I appreciate that Volunteer Solutions was recognized for, for Helping Hands. Thank you. Well, I hope everyone, this is uh, Bill Murray. I think I'm up next and um, uh, hopeful everybody can hear me. I'm seeing the subtitles, so I think, uh, I think I'm coming through. Uh, let me just say how pleased I am again to be engaged with uh, the Aging Network. I hope I can still use that terminology. Uh, 20 years ago, I was the staffer for the General Assembly's Long-Term Care Subcommittee long-term care and aging subcommittee of the uh, Joint Commission on Healthcare. So I must apologize that my terminology is 20 years out of date. However, the partners and the leaders in this field have not changed that much, including uh, my longtime friend and somebody I admire greatly, Dr. Lindsay was a leader then, is a leader now. Uh, the uh, area agencies on aging were certainly critical uh, components of uh, the service tapestry, as was Centera Healthcare. So I'm glad to see all of those players still at the table and I can simply say how important everything you all do is. We've known all my career, we've known about the, uh, the sort of aging of society and how critical that issue was. And let's be honest, policymakers have not always taken something that was 20 years or 15 years or 10 years or even five years out as seriously as perhaps they could. Well, the future is now as uh, uh, a, a coach of what is now the Washington football team once said, father of a former governor of ours, future is now. Uh, aging issues are absolutely critical to the fabric of our society. And we're only gonna deal with this challenge with the types of innovation we've seen today. So let me just say on behalf of all of my colleagues uh, here, how pleased we are to sponsor these awards and thank all of you uh, for the innovative thinking and thank the department for continuing the tradition of this program. And with that, I will shut up and let you get back to your program. Uh, my name is Diana Pawara. I am a member of the Best Practices Committee member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Murray, Commissioner Hayfield, and all the present, Dr. Lindsay, and all the presenters for contributing their time and talents to today's webinar. I should be remiss if I did not also take a moment to highlight the three honorable mention programs from this year. And they are Longevity Project for a Greater Richmond for its Housing Stability Learning Labs, Senior Connections, 
the Capital Area Agency on Agent for its Right Connections Program, and Central Virginia Alliance for Community Living for its Take Charge Care Transition Intervention. The 2020 Best Practices Committee included Dr. Lindsay as chair, Dr. Catherine Reed, David Farnon, Vernon Wiley, and myself, Diana Pawaga. This was the last year of Council on Aging Membership Services for David, Vernon, and Dr. Lindsay. We thank them for their years of services and dedication to the very important work. We are grateful to again have Dominion Energy Support for the Best Practices Awards and thank them for joining us today to highlight these fantastic programs. This, this webinar will be archived and made available on the DARS YouTube page and linked on the Council on Agents website. We hope this will continue to serve as a resource for those around Virginia interested in learning more about these wonderful programs and possibly seeking to replace them in their communities. To replicate, sorry. As we conclude the 2020 Best Practices Awards and in the coming month, this very bizarre 2020 calendar year, the Best Practices Awards Committee is already starting to look to 2021. Committee members will be working closely with DARS staff over the next few months to prepare for the 2021 nomination process. Information about how to apply or how to nominate a program will be posted on the Council on Agents website in mid-January 2021. The committee received 20 applications this year, making the awards very competitive. I have no doubt that as organizations and programs have adapted and responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and to meet the needs of older adults across the Commonwealth, that the 2021 Best Practices Award would also produce high quality and vital programs for recognition. I mean, 2021 Best Practices. Thank you all for joining us today. And this concludes the webinar. Thank you so much.